right we're right at 12 o'clock so i'm going to go ahead and get it started here um we currently have uh i don't know i'll come ahead for the 11 people online right now uh with us and how many people do we have four about 11 people in the room um so we're gonna ed's gonna uh, kick us off with the welcome but i just want to formally thank you for coming to esda's 2022 semi-annual membership meeting and i'm gonna hand it over to ed hopefully we're, we're still trying to manage uh, the online versus in-person uh, situation so things may not go as smoothly as we like but i'm gonna hand over all right, welcome. Uh, today is uh, the 11th membership meeting of this organization since we started in February 2017. Uh, we are completing five year anniversary of the organization today and celebrating that along with 20 years ago in February of 20, uh, 2002. Uh, the Everett train station opened with a grand, well-attended audience at a ribbon-cutting ceremony to celebrate the arrival of uh, uh, our new brand spanking new train station along with the uh, building of a transit center to consolidate all transportation in the city of Everett, which had been bus station here, train station there, other uh, transportation in different places in our city. Um, so we have uh, ordered a cake. And the cake, uh, you might have seen it when you came in, celebrating 20 years of uh, Transit Center and five years of Everett Station District Alliance. Um, we're going to have it uh, taken away from us momentarily, to have pieces cut. So everybody in the room will have a piece of cake in just a little while. Um, we assemble twice a year in June and December as a membership organization. And uh, we uh, use this time to present what we have been up to as an organization uh, in the prior six months and what we are planning to be involved in as we go forward. Uh, so this is our opportunity to hear from the membership uh, and inform the membership of the good things that are happening with the organization. Um, we want to thank Delta Marriott Hotel. Danielle Caloro is here with us. She's the general manager here. She's also a board member for the Ever Station District Alliance and is donating uh, these facilities for the benefit of our uh, neighborhood building work uh, and uh, they are active members in supporting the, the work that we are doing. So thank you, Danielle. Absolutely. And as I understand it, uh, coming out of COVID, the, your organization has normalized and you are now fully uh, uh, occupied with events and, and uh, customers in, in, your, in your building. Yes, it's a very quick return for us. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah, uh, you've been on board now for six months. Uh, since August of last year. Oh, okay, ten months. Yeah. All right, coming up on your anniversary here in a little while. Uh, let's do we. I don't know. If the introductions would be good. Uh, can we? Do, I don't think we have. We can uh, do that with the people in the room. Let's do that. Okay. Yeah. So we have a very full agenda. So why don't we go first? We'll go around the room, um, and then uh, I can read out the folks out of it. Good morning. I'm Pete Seikbaum. I own uh, six properties in this district. Danielle Kubota with Delta Marriott. Liz Stenning, Executive Director with the Downtown Everett Association. John Trainer with the International Brotherhood of Life Workers Local 191. Uh, Jennifer Cross, I own the dog spot on 36th Street. Paul Henry, Engineer Sports, for Lance Miller, also with Engineer Sports, uh, for a sports physical therapy clinic in uh, downtown Everett. Uh, Ty Farrell, I'm on the Everett Station District Alliance Board. Paula Ryan, Everett City Council Member, District 2. 
Mary Bradley, Everett City Council Member District 1. And I'm Ed Peterson, President of the Everett Station District Alliance. Perfect. Who's here online? I'm going to do my best here. Um, so, Neil Maddie um, with JMC Cabinetry and Property Details, where it's partnered with. Uh, Brenda White uh, with Stone Tree, Red Plus Sports, Red Stop, Red Stop, Red Real Estate. Eric Whitstrand with Sound Transit. Justin W, and I gotta admit, I don't know Justin, uh, what, uh, who you're with. Um, Kerry uh, Watts, Watts, Watts. Uh, Lauren Douglas with Sound Transit, Megan Dunn, Sound uh, County Council member, Nick Bratton, Portera, Nicole Pettigrew, uh, Kevin Permente, Patrick Paul, president of the Downtown Everett Association, and probably many other hats, um, and Sylvia Anderson, executive director of the Rick Dawson. That is our roster for today. Okay. So um, we're hard spread apart here. We, you know, we, had we really had a good count, we probably would have assembled ourselves a little closer to each other. Um, but so be it. Uh, let's uh, get started by inviting our city council members who with redistricting in the city of Everett. We now have district one and not district two that uh, uh, are large districts, part of which are in this neighborhood. So we have two members on the city council that we are able to have uh, ongoing conversations with about the well being of this neighborhood. So we're gonna invite them to uh, say a few words. They've been out each been on the city council for Five months and 15 days. Six months. I get five. Yeah. Five and a half months. So who wants to go first? Tom Russell. <laughs> District two. Paula Ryan. One feature of our video here is that it's going to follow us no matter where you're at. So, so you laps. You can do laps. You can also just stand where you're at if you like. Or Uh, my name is Paula Ryan. I'm from uh, Everett City Council District 2. And as I had mentioned, this year is the first year that Everett's been a uh, districting uh, representation. <laughs> so there's seven uh, seats on the City Council and five of our districted seats, and two seats are at large. So all five of those districts represent a specific geographic area in uh, the city of Everett. And I represent District 2, which includes the area by the port through downtown over here to the train station. The neighborhood's just south of there from Port Gardner down to Valley View. So, um, uh, Councilor Fossey and I basically split the, the area down here. So, it's, uh, it's, I'm excited that it's in my district. It's one of the most exciting places in the city of Everett to see uh, just what the potential is for this area and the ways that the communities are coming together to uh, put in their thoughts and ideas and suggestions and concerns and are doing it all come to fruition. So, I'm uh, really excited to be here today and hear all the updates. I uh, wanted to highlight a few things that's happened in council and in the area over the last few months. Um, as you guys probably know, May was Bike Everywhere Month. And so I rode my sweet bike out down here for the Bike Everywhere Day event on, I believe it was May 20th. And it was a great showing of uh, just a lot of the different, um, let's see, if the uh, Ever Transit was there, PUD was there, the city of Everett had some representatives talk about uh, the biking programs that they've been working on, uh, the police, Department was there, the fire department was there, and so was, uh, I got my bike registered, and it was just a great way to see that how the city and uh, partners are working together to increase multimodal transportation options in the city. So I'm really excited to also see how that uh, keeps progressing. Uh, the city recently earned a, a bronze award for our bikeability in the area, so uh, there's definitely a lot of work that still can't be done, but I'm glad that it's one of the city's priorities, and I'm happy to have that as one of my priorities as well. Uh, the city uh, recently passed a resolution allocating some of our ARPA dollars, so it's the American Rescue Plan Act dollars from the federal government, and all cities and all states, counties, cities across the nation receive an allocation based on uh, legal population size. So the city of Everett uh, will be receiving about $20 million. Uh, for, uh, about $1.5 million has been allocated in the previous council, and then about a month ago, uh, City Council allocated another 5.8 million. Uh, specific to the Everett Station District Alliance, a portion of that allocation included funding to add 20 more pallets at the 
pallet shelter site at Union Gospel Mission. And then accompanied with that is uh, money towards uh, behavioral health services and case management so that the folks that are uh, that move into the pallet shelter site also have access to a navigator to help them uh, get connected to the services that they need to put them on a path towards stability. So I'll look forward to um, how that works out for the people that are moving in there. Uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, in the last uh, state legislative cycle, the Washington State Legislature passed the Move Ahead Washington Plan, which is a big transportation package. And a, a portion of that included funding for local transit agencies to adopt free fare for yeah. youth under the age of 18. So I think it was two weeks ago at city council, uh, we passed uh, the, the resolution needed to, to change the fare structure for uh, Ever Transit to for free fare uh, under the age of 18 so that youth uh, can ride the bus for free. And the benefit of doing that is that with the fare change, we will have access to $2 million a year from the state to compensate us for um, opening up the free fare for youth program. So that'll, it's in, that's on path to open up starting July 1st. So it's a really great way for you to be able to access the bus this summer. Uh, personally, I'd like to see um, even more expanded access to our transportation system. Um, the city's gonna be coming back with some uh, analysis and uh, work on looking into ways that we can have additional programs so that there could be potentially more uh, free fare programs through Evertransit. Uh, specifically, I've asked for a look into expanding the age for youth up to the age of 21, uh, free fare for seniors and disabled, free fare for students with a valid student ID, and free fare for veterans. Um, so I'm hopeful that when the uh, city comes back with that, that it will show that with the extra money that we're receiving from um, from the state through the transportation package, and that Delta will you know, more than compensate the city for expanding access to uh, Ever Transit. And then, in addition to that, um, uh, with access to transit, removing those financial barriers is really important, but also removing any geographical barriers is important too. So, that's another reason I'm excited to be here today to hear more about uh, the work that the, uh, the Station District Alliance is doing to um, just make this a really amazing transit oriented development for the city of Everett. I think it's got a great potential and I'm just glad to be here and uh, share my ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Paula. Yeah. Governor Poppy, uh, feel free to go for um, yeah. where you're at or uh, Yeah, uh, so she covered some of the stuff that we've been working on recently. So uh, I'll give you just a, a little bit of data that I'll talk about what's coming for us uh, upcoming. So you can track that. Uh, you probably you went to sort of culture, I hope. Uh, that was a huge success that recently happened. Uh, the mayor gave us an update also on kind of our economic activity that's been going on as compared to last year. We're about the same level. We're a little bit down in uh, some of our housing uh, development permits, but uh, the commercial uh, activity, I guess, is significantly up. So that's uh, promising. Uh, yeah, 60% higher than uh, last year at this time. So that's pretty cool. And Let's see. I don't need to talk to you about that. Uh, coming before us this month. Uh, so she talked about the increase in our pallet shelter. They're going to bring forward a proposal uh, for site location, outreach plan, and a variety of sort of additional site for pallet shelter development. Uh, so it'll talk about the management agency, the desired population we're trying to reach. Kind of thing. So that will be coming before us this month. Uh, we're also going to be looking at trail improvements uh, around the Silver Lake Loop Trail, and we have some fun events coming up. Uh, June 25th, uh, 11 to 2, is the Stoko Pride uh, event, so be sure to catch that at Forest Park. And then the library is also doing uh, the Sharing Wheels Community Bike Shop to offer free repairs. So you can drop by the Evergreen Branch 3 to 6 on Tuesday, uh, June 14th. Let's see. Another one next month. So that's it for the events. Uh, you guys I'm sure are curious about the planning commission, and they are continuing to do more work in their next meeting on what they were previously dealing with with the Senate bill that passed uh, 5235. We were addressing um, the amount of people that could live in a dwelling unit, and so they're trying to remove the city's limits on that. So they are going to uh, address those two topics more uh, 
and review this year's update on the transportation improvement program for next year. And then there's going to be some staffing changes. Uh, we have some uh, RPD uh, retiring right now, and then we also have uh, Deb has been promoted, and so we move all our offices to look at something new. So um, if you if you have a chance to reach Deb, make sure to say congratulations for her. Thank you so much, council members. Uh, it's been great to have a partnership with you uh, over your short tenure that you've been uh, on council. Uh, we have about four minutes for questions. So if folks have questions for our council members, uh, feel free to ask. John, I'm sure you have a question. <laughs> Don't like tell it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm curious about this dwelling unit uh, limit, the number of uh, persons who can live in a dwelling unit. What is that limit for? So previously there was a policy in place that limited, uh, it's based on a little bit of outdated policy is my understanding, um, that is not considered uh, racially friendly and so when the process of reviewing this with the Senate bill that passed legislation, they've had to make some adjustments. So that is what they have made that change, but they're going to do a deeper dive into the next meeting is my understanding as a planning commission. Uh, and I can send you the information. Um, I'd, I'd be curious. Yeah, we'll change information afterwards. There's no other questions. Um, thank you so much, council members. Yeah. Um, Megan, council member Megan Dunn is also with us. Uh, so uh, maybe we have like one minute. If anybody had a, a question for council member uh, Megan Dunn, uh, I'm happy to also take that. But uh, I, I don't think she's been very many questions. So, okay. We'll go on to our next agenda item, uh, which is me. So we kind of missed a couple of parts that I want to highlight before I jump into my uh, update. So just to first make sure that you know the agenda for today. Um, I'm going to go over state of organization or updates from the executive director, um, as well as have an update from Jim Cross, our vice president, and Smith Avenue committee chair. Uh, for an update on safety issues in the neighborhood. Um, and then Ty Farrell, our treasurer, will provide an update on our finances. Um, then we'll go into a current update of the BI proposal. Um, Sound Transit will provide our presentation on the Everpeak extension. And then ESDA will follow up with something we've been pushing for over the last few months, which is what we're calling option tracks for a station location here. Um, and then finally, we'll end with Kaiser Permanente and Nicole Pettigrew providing a presentation on the expansion plan, which you may have seen uh, moving forward across the street from the hotel here. And then we'll wrap up. Rob, could you check in with the people online if they are able to hear us well? Um, everybody's saying yes. Well, everybody being one person and another person. <laughs> We're good in the chat. Um, they, I'm noticing that uh, sometimes our speakers are tailing off their sentences a little bit, and uh, I'm worried that the transmission might not get to the full audience. And so, I, just a reminder to everybody as you speak, try to be mindful of being loud enough for an audience uh, uh, online uh, to hear you. So, we have good reports from online. Good. Okay, so there's a couple other things. Uh, here's a list for our board members for those of you who are. And I'm, I'm noticing I need to, uh, for those in the room, adjust the screen. So. Okay. Um, a key highlight of our members if you advocate your dues, please pay your dues online. We have one more. Uh, thanks, Keith, for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to thank our uh, sponsors, uh, Kaiser Permanente for the grant uh, for our work this year uh, on the Convergence Collaborative, and then uh, GTR and Glacier Properties. 
as well as the sport. And for those of you who are new to that Precision District Alliance, this is generally our boundaries for the neighborhood. Uh, Broadway, Hewitt, I-5, and then down 44th Street on the side. Okay, that kind of jump in the updates. So our priorities for this year have been uh, the Clean Safe Program with the Dock Street Program, the Smith Avenue Safety Forum, which Jennifer will go over in a little bit. We've been working on plant, um, parking issues for a couple of years now, um, and then the business improvement area came up here. Uh, around neighborhood enhancement, our big thing is uh, a mural project, which is being funded with the Ford grant. Uh, we, I think, are close to having a contract between the city and the nonprofit that will be uh, managing the artists and the call for artists and everything to do with that piece. Uh, but that'll end up with three murals plus a, a mural on the bridge uh, going over Smith Avenue. So it's setting up in the bridge there. And then finally, it is preparing for a future of uh, thinking about how can we grow. So last year we had a convergence study to look at the potential development of city properties. And we're looking at next steps for implementing that through a convergence collaborative. There's a station during the project. The Everlink EIS, extension EIS, and uh, the city council's account. So, those few things. I'm not going to go over all of those because some of them are going to be touched on by Jennifer, and then we have them in presentations. So, um, just a real highlight, high level here. So, this has been a priority for us over the spring, and we have a couple of presentations later. But uh, the Everlink extension has been moving forward, and so we've been paying close attention to it. Again, we'll be presented, we'll be presentations on that later. Um, the Station to Arena project back in 2019, we worked with the city to secure $1.9 million from Sound Transit to improve the walking and biking experience from the station to the Angel of Wings, Light Girls, uh, Angel of Wings uh, Arena. Um, you see on the left, uh, on this map, uh, on the left, is uh, the, the route of the project along uh, Smith on the east side of the ramp, goes underneath the Pacific Ocean Pass, and then to Wall and then back to the station. This is the official project document now from the city, so we're glad to see it starting forward with the city, uh, but no additional documents yet from the city in terms of next steps. We expect that over the next six months or so to move forward. Um, this is the mural, uh, a couple of images for the mural project. I already highlighted it, but we are really looking forward to the enhancement that can be done underneath that Pacific Avenue bridge and how that can be a brighter, more inviting space that's less scary for pedestrians. There is a new development going in right next to it, and I think that there's a lot of synergy that can happen. Um, the big project that we've been working on, thanks to support from Kaiser Permanente, is our community collaborative. Uh, we hope to be having a three-year uh, program of implementing the convergence study report that we had last year, the recommendations by building a collaborative effort between all stakeholders in the neighborhood. And so we've been spending this year setting up that three-year process. Uh, there's this fancy Venn diagram here uh, <laughs> showing how it will all work together as a genuine community collaborative of all the partners that we have, all the stakeholders in the community. It, it being guided by equity uh, through the study, we established equity principles through an equity committee, um, and we will continue to convene that group and have them guide our work. Um, there will be a leadership advisory council to help make sure that they be like quarterly, make sure the entire project moves forward. And then we have a nonprofit social services work group that has been meeting, seven, I think, six times so far this year and has started to develop uh, the three year work plan for their work, including um, a uh, safety and health uh, initiative um, that will be a combination of three core components. One is our BIA supported neighborhood safety ambassadors, uh, partnership with Compass Health, and their community outreach team as well as hopefully uh, the city of Everett's uh, police department and slash uh, community development co-ed team, their community outreach team. 
Uh, so that way we can take a holistic approach and um, working with people in need on our streets and connecting them to community services centers, as well as addressing the serious safety uh, issues that exist in the community. Um, a third and final piece to this is continuing to figure out the housing, built environment, and streetscape aspect to the neighborhood. And so we've had more groups in the past known for two weeks uh, to work towards the implementation of uh, really taking advantage of the, the, the existing transit center and the future light rail station here in the neighborhood. Um, so with that, that's the key collective. Finally, just a uh, highlight of uh, existing development that has been planned in the neighborhood. None of this is necessarily new in particular, um, but we see uh, progress has been made by uh, Joey Ferrix Graham uh, Land Company's uh, development, which is a seven story development that will happen in Pacific Smith and Payne. Um, there is the uh, proposed back plus that's being developed at uh, Pacific Cedar. Um, and then Compass Health, uh, not only last year, opened um, a new 80 bed, 82 unit. 82 unit facility, but is making progress on its expansion plan as well. Finally, at the end of today, we'll have a whole presentation on how to promote its expansion. So big thanks continuing to happen. With that, I'm going to hand it over to a big chunk of our work that we do, um, which is around safety. So I'm going to hand it over. To just take a minute and just see if there's any questions oh, yeah. for you on the on the things that you've described for us. Everybody back in the back able to hear Brock is going on? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, Brock mentioned the station to arena project. So that's uh, I'm interested in that. You, you said the city is still coming out with, with the plan will be there. Is that like streetscaping or sidewalks? Yeah, good question. So city is currently internally doing the design work and figuring out exactly what it will include. When we uh, proposed it to the city to propose it to Sound Transit, we included uh, making sure that there was sidewalks the entire uh, way, that the curb ramps were appropriate. There's a couple of places where there's some curb ramps. There's a lot, a lot of places where there's no sidewalks. Um, and then uh, doing some wayfinding for cyclists to come. So those are the, the improvements. Um, I'm not sure exactly what would be in front of engineered sports at this time. I'm not sure that there would be a ton that would be different than there is. I do imagine along uh, North Cascade building materials that there might be some significant improvements for the pedestrians. Yeah, we, you know, we've been there for 15 years and we got a lot of you know, folks that use a train and bus yeah. and additional sidewalks getting yeah. you know, to our facility in there. So that's kind of exciting to hear that yeah. something's coming. We're, I mean, I'm, I've been very excited about the project. The lighting there is also pretty yeah. bad. So I'm hoping yeah. that there'll be some lighting. Yeah. Right, so so the, the bridge you're referring to with the mural is mm -hmm. that's what you would pass on. So I got my bearing straight here. Yeah. You pass pass on the like that. Pass yep. As you head to Wall Street. Exactly. Thank you. And so it, related to that, is there opportunities for neighbor, neighborhood input and participation in finalizing the plan? Do you, do you know whether there is a built in plan for opportunities for input? Um, there will be outreach from the city to the community. Um, we don't yet know what that looks like from the city. The city has a chair of uh, their outreach plan. Um, that's something that uh, Christina, who is the project manager of that, is usually on these calls and she's not here today. So, <laughs> Christina Curtis is her name, so they might make a note of that for uh, opportunities to input. Those three developments that you showed a moment ago in the email that you sent? Uh, 
They've been in past emails, okay. not in the most recent email. Um, yeah, this uh, this one has been since I think February of last year. Uh, I've got approval through the Council for Advance or some sense of action. Um, Compass Health has done a ton of outreach to town hall uh, for their project. They're, and they'll be entering the demolition stage of their project this year. Yes. And this project, um, which is maybe closest to the projects, um, it just got approval, I think, in February for the site for the plan. Uh, it's not, uh, I don't know the stage of funding for either uh, this project or this project to know whether we're going to break ground or not, uh, but they've gone through the city permit process. Any more questions? Let's, let's jump to Jennifer, and then if you have additional questions, you can ask. Okay, so I, I can just stay here. Yes. But I'll make sure that I keep my sentences loud right till the very end. Good job, Dan. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. So um, I'm Jennifer Cross. Like I said, I'm the owner of the dog spot, which is down on 36th and Smith. Um, so we're kind of right in the middle of the area of sometimes safety concern. Um, I'm also an ESD member um, and have been for many years. And for the last year, I've been the ESDA executive committee vice president and also heading up the Smith Avenue Safety Forum. So. Uh, the Smith Avenue Safety Forum was thought of by Brock as a way for business owners, property owners, people down in our neighborhood to communicate with each other, uh, share ideas, share information. We really would like it to become just a, a, a community way for business owners in particular to let each other know when we're struggling or when we're seeing patterns. Um, we all want to get where we can look out for each other, kind of a neighborhood watch type of an idea um, and share information. So we have a um, quarterly meeting. We did meet monthly for a while, but we've been able to back off to quarterly. Um, and we have an ongoing um, email group where people can report if they've seen something or they've had something happen or if they have a question about safety um, or need information about something. So um, if anyone is a property owner here or knows anybody that would be interested in joining that group, um, it is always open for joining and we like to have new members and we love to have people come to our meetings and talk about how the safety is around their particular business. So um, slide wise, that's really far away from me. <laughs> um, but the first slide we've got is our crime data for Smith, our Smith Avenue area from, is it from the beginning of the year, Brock? I can't see that far. Uh, it is from January 2015. Oh, wow. Okay, perfect. So um, things we would like to point out here, this is available on the ESDA website all the time. People want to monitor what our area is looking like. Um, we have had reported instances and Everett PD cases continue to decline year over year, which is great news. Um, this year, we've seen an increase in reported instances from February to May, which is not atypical, especially when the weather starts to get nicer and people start being out more. Um, I will point out that this Data is only for reported incidents. Um, and so there is a lot of stuff that happens down in our neighborhood that gets missed in reporting. Either it feels too small, or sometimes there's a reporting fatigue, a feeling that you know nothing might happen. So we always want to reiterate that these statistics drive the police presence presence in our neighborhood. So please report things, even if you feel like it's not important. Um, I've spoken with the chief of police and their adamant message is always report everything absolutely because that way they have accurate information so they can make decisions about what they're going to do in regards to our neighborhood. Um, sorry, I have my notes on my phone. <laughs> um, so I just want to acknowledge um, there was a fatal shooting on May 3rd at the storehouse mini storage. Um, it's currently being investigated by the police as a murder. Um, and we will provide more information through the forum as we get it. But good to good for everybody to know that that was a really significant incident that happened down in our neighborhood not that long ago. Um, I think I already encouraged reporting to the Smith Avenue Safety Forum. Um, both if you're already a member of it, please, if something happens, even if it seems small, 
take a moment to put an email out there so we can all keep our eyes out for each other. And if you'd like to join the committee, just let me or Brock know and we can add you. Okay, our next quarterly Smith Avenue Safety Forum meeting is Thursday, July 7th at noon. Um, it's via Zoom. So if you are already on our email forum, you should have gotten the invitations for that. If you haven't seen one, let me know. Um, and if you are not a member of the forum, but would like an invitation to the meeting, again, just let me know. Um, it's a really good opportunity for everybody to get together and just talk about what they've been experiencing the last couple months. The city of Seattle is usually present there. There is Everett PD present there. So it's a great opportunity for us to keep the city informed of what it's like to be a business down on Smith Avenue. Um, and then also it's a great way to ask questions of the police if you have things or need tips for ways that you can deal with things smartly. Okay, slide number two. So this is a slide of the Pallet Project, which is located behind the Everett Gospel Mission, which is just a few blocks from my particular location. Um, like Paula said, there is um, there will be 20 new shelters added. Um, I had the opportunity, gosh, months ago to go tour this facility with Ed. It was fantastic. Um, it's been a game changer for our neighborhood. We are overjoyed with what has happened as far as the um, physical looks of the neighborhood and it really gels with most of the neighborhood's um, goals of creating a place that's both safe and kind and provides services for people. So um, we're just continuing to be very supportive of this whole entire program and really happy with it and hope that it gets traction in other parts of the city too. Okay. And last slide. This is our adopt a street program again thought of by brock at the esda it's been an awesome program for us we have a lot of um, issues with trash and graffiti and things like that down in our neighborhood so um our latest one was july 23rd we had 23 volunteers and we collected 46 bags of trash so um the next cleanup will be uh saturday july 23rd 9 to 11 a.m and you can sign up online um, and Brock is always great about sending out invitations for that. If you want more information about that, you can ask either through the forum or you can ask Brock directly. And that's my safety update. Perfect. One uh, comment is that we're on the uh, 15 days from the one year anniversary of the no sit, no lie ordinance and the pallet project, which we bunched together, had a lot of conversation with property owners engaged in uh, input into the plan with the city. So on the one year anniversary of No Sit, No Lie and, and uh, 20 for 20 pallets, and the other 20 are actually in. So they're co-functioning with 40 pallets now. Uh, what would be your uh, take or how would you describe for the group the uh, uh, implementation of those two components? Um, well, like I said, I would, I would say night and day isn't too dramatic of a way to put it. Um, there was concern amongst the property owners when the pallet structures were announced. Um, we have always been very vocal about wanting to create an inclusive neighborhood that provides services and, and housing for everyone. But at the time when the pallet structures were proposed, it was one of the worst times in my 12 year history of owning a business down there just as far as the aesthetics of the neighborhood. And I can only speak for myself in terms of, I think there's a big difference between safety and aesthetics, um, but the aesthetics really impacts our business a lot. So if there's a lot of people camping, I mean, I had you know tents and, and wooden shelters built basically right across the street from my business. Um, and it was really growing quite quickly. And we were starting to have problems with clients asking if I was going to be able to keep their dogs safe. And, it was starting to impact business, which is a huge concern. So having the no sit, no lie and the pallet shelters together was really important um, as a way to make the business owners feel like their um, needs were being protected while still providing a critical service. So we pushed, as business owners, we pushed very hard to have both of them adopted at the same time. Um, and the city was really great about hearing us and they wound up coming in together. So, I mean, within two days, everything was cleared and gone and it hasn't come back. Um, and the neighborhood looks very safe. You know, there's still a lot of small crime that is happening. That's just part of our reality. 
Um, but in terms of walkability and people driving down and choosing to visit our businesses, it's been extremely, uh, it's been a huge game changer. We're really, really happy with it. And we really want it to stay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, nicely done. And only speaking for myself, but. The safety forum, I think, is uh, seeing a proliferation of catalytic converters uh, being uh, cut out of cars and vehicles throughout that particular area. Yeah, uh, there's been lots of fences cut, small, small thefts from people's lots overnight, batteries, things like that. Um, so we're, we're all communicating through the forum, talking about having better lighting. Um, you know, I don't leave work until nine o'clock most nights, so I'll tool around past the businesses that I know have been struggling and just, you know, put my eyes on it. So if I see something that's weird, I can call it in if the business owner isn't there. I think that we can all be really great advocates for each other. And I, as a business owner, I really want that kind of connection with other business owners. So. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, everybody. Um, next, we'll go to our treasurer's report. Uh, so. Great. So uh, behind the scenes, we have uh, some few things happening on the financial side. Um, I was appointed as treasurer. I don't know if we had a, did we have somebody filling the treasurer position before? Uh, we did have, but not an active, active role. We've uh, updated the job description and, and uh, you're the first for this particular set of duties. Great. And much simplified, um, which I appreciate. And uh, so, and the other thing, the other big thing is we uh, shifted from housing, having Housing Hope manage our finances to a um, accounting firm, CLA. They're a national firm, reputable, and uh, they've been helping us transfer the books from Housing Hope. That's still underway, but we, it's looking really good for us. And um, once that's completed, we're going to be able to just push a button and have a whole series of financial reports that we need to, to see the financial health of the organization. And um, overall, uh, as you can see, things are looking uh, pretty good. Budget. Oh, this is the budget. Okay, this is the budget. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, this is our budget. We were anticipating $160,000 uh, of fund, total funding and revenue and, and concomitant expenses. And then uh, maybe we can go to the Actuals. Yeah. Uh, I'll just note one thing on here so it's clear. There's a big white section to this pie chart, and that's back in December when we presented it. We presented it as if uh, a BIA could be part of the organization, and we didn't obviously know when it would happen, or when it would happen. Um, but we wanted to show, you know, our intention is for that program to grow, so we had presented it this way, um, and so. That's the numbers here listed are the numbers within our budget. This is the number for the BIA budget within our budget. Uh, the kind of nominal number, the notional number was 300,000 to put on to put on for the chart, yeah. right? So this is the same charts with our actual year to date, uh, just so you can do it. But I think time, so you can see our revenue um, is uh, on track with our budget. But uh, if I can mention a little more about that, and our expenses are obviously we're only five and a half months through uh, this year. And so uh, we're well on track in that regard, not by comparison to the budget. But Ty wanted these charts to be able to uh, explain it. So I'll hand it back to Ty. So you can see we're a little bit below where we were hoping to be in terms of revenue. Uh, the main reason is that. Um, we were looking for a, we had we had anticipated an Everett Forward grant that was we were going to manage to uh, uh, get these murals painted around the neighborhood, but that's going to be managed instead by uh, Urban Artworks, and the money is going to go directly to the artists, so we're not going to be managing that. Um, and our main source of revenue is a grant uh, from the Kaiser Permanente. Uh, and uh, our expenses are going to pick up actually and then in the second half of the year we're planning to hire a um, community program manager for the uh, convergence community collaborative 
project. So yeah. And then of course, if we, uh, if the PIA is approved by the city council, which we, we hope, then 2023 could look significantly different in terms of revenue and in terms of the services that we can provide in the neighborhood, which we're very excited about. Are there any questions for Ty on the uh, budget uh, and uh, for uh, other aspects of this report? And anybody that's online is welcome to uh, participate as well in questions. And I, I'm monitoring the chat. And the chat's probably the easiest way if you do have questions online instead of raising your hand or coming off of uh, or turning on your camera. Uh, just tap in the chat with these things. And then I can put you on. So we're halfway through the year, and uh, we'll provide a full report on the on the year through uh, early through the end of November at the end of June uh, in December. Okay. Well, so concludes our uh, kind of state of the district state of the organization update. Um, next on the agenda is the current EIA proposal. So. Um, are you ready to go? Let's go. Okay. Um, so uh, this will be a similar presentation to what we had in December, but I want to make sure we're all up to date on it and know where we're going forward on the proposal. So the key highlights is that the current, the new Every Station District VI proposal has three big points. Uh, it's focused on our critical needs. It's been re right sized to the areas with our strongest supporters. And it's a place to start and grow. You know, it's, it's not everything that we would imagine it could become, but it's a way to provide a proof of concept for it to grow over time uh, to provide services to the entire community. Shutter Keeper, which computer did click? We know that our current challenges remain around safety and the appearance of safety around trash and graffiti and other elements like that. And that, a lot of that has to do with people just being in need and then people need services. Um, so those are the big challenges that we heard through our engagement last year. And to recap how we got here today, um, this, started, this conversation started way back in 2019 Actually, earlier with some actions um, with City Council of getting funding for this work. But in terms of my time here, it started in February 2019. We created a steering committee to explore creating a VI Hague. In January of 20, sorry, June of 2019, we began talking and getting support from property owners. In November of that year, we submitted a proposal to City Council that was signing support of 57% through a positive conversation, which represented 65% of the total neighborhood. Um, in December, city council voted 7-0 in favor of the proposal, but had amended the boundaries, which under state law required um, additional notice. And so an additional meeting needed to be set up. In January through March, because uh, the question we started to confirm the support through affidavits in addition to the petitions we already had signed. 2020 was when the pandemic started. Um, and so we stopped doing the affidavits, but we had gotten uh, to estimated 60% support at the end of the affidavit uh, collection uh, for us to take it back to council. But we decided the pandemic was here, the stay at home order went in place. We didn't know what the economic repercussions would be. So we shut down on David's and said, we're going to postpone this until a future time when we have a better understanding of the economy. Uh, I'm breaking here. This is a good transition point to announce that the cake has been cut. <laughs> it's sliced. It's sitting in the back there. There are plates, there are forks. Please help yourself to a piece of cake in honor of our celebration of the fifth anniversary. Sorry, folks online. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in 2021, we have renewed the effort by listening to property owners and community members. Um, the board itself discussed extensively uh, about 
the opportunity to open the uh, start this conversation with the BIA and what it would look like. And every board meeting last year, we were discussing it as to what it should look like. Um, we conducted an online survey of private property owners, um, and the board approved a draft proposal determining the safety support. Uh, and so that happened uh, right around the same time as our annual membership meeting last December. Um, since then, we've been having one-on-one -on -one conversations with uh, we have started with our supporters from last time because we needed to ground truth it with those who are already supportive. Like, if it wasn't, um, if our supporters didn't even want to move forward, then we shouldn't move forward. Uh, and so we started taking the, the, uh, the proposal to uh, our property owners and asking for their support. Um, we set out to say that if we reach 60% support, um, we would continue to seek support from all property owners, not just limited to once we hit 60. And that we would also, that would be a trigger for notifying the city administration. I'm gonna go over now the proposal uh, that we have and a little bit of the survey data that went into it. And then we'll circle back into the next steps we're going. So just big picture, um, organizationally, what we have always kind of conceived of how the BIA and the ESD would work together is there's a component of services that be funded by the BIA, then there would be other things that be funded through outside sources that are not funded by, by the BIA. And so that would come from grants, sponsorships, and other things like that. Uh, so that's one big picture. So there's a whole set of work that, we're, that we could continue to do without financial support from BIA. For example, this year we're funded uh, from, by Kaiser Permanente for the emergency collateral. And so that's a significant grant source for doing uh, the planning work for the new uh, So that is built into our, our thinking of this. Um, what we heard through the survey um, was that we should uh, right size the BIA to prove the utility and effectiveness of it. Um, start with a smaller budget uh, that focuses on core services and smaller boundaries. Uh, so that way, we have that overwhelming support to have a proof of concept move forward. And you know, after a few years of doing this and being able to show we were effective, go back and expand later. That we needed to focus on safety, cleaning, parking, and enhancement of the neighborhood, leaning really heavily on the safety piece. Uh, I'll go into the, uh, some of the data back in the survey. Um, and then again, when effectiveness is demonstrated, then uh, reconsider the expansion of the boundaries and program. Um, so in 2019, our proposal for the BIA had put just under 60% of the budget towards uh, safety and cleaning program. Um, just uh, the counting and management of the program is just under 10%. And then just over 10% included, um, I'm sure I got this right, uh, marketing and communications and economic development, advocacy, uh, and then some on the enhancement and parking issues. Let's give you a picture of this. And the next pie chart shows the current proposal. So we have really taken the budget, although the budget was smaller, we made sure that we kind of kept that safety and training program whole. Um, so that way, that ends up being almost three quarters of our budget. And then in terms of percentage of our budget, more dedicated towards enhancement and parking, uh, and then the other piece that we use as well. And uh, I will say that Management of the organization of it uh, goes from a full FE plus FEE into a part time FEE for managing this program. So, this is just another way of looking at it in terms of the uh, impact of the budget between the two uh, years of 2019 versus 2022. 
Okay. From our survey, we did hear a lot of fears that safety was important. And then we asked a follow up question well, what would you like to see in terms of your safety program? Um, number one was having staff monitoring of like date time, neighborhood ambassadors out on the street, eyes on the street, engaging with people, uh, being able to make sure that the street, that our neighborhood is safe. Uh, there was also strong support for having a, a, a social worker component to our work. Um, strong <coughs> support. We had asked a question of the SOTO BIA in Seattle uh, actually funds uh, FTE within Seattle's chronic condition. So we asked if that was something that folks were interested in. There was interest in that. Um, and also interest in just physical improvements to the neighborhood, things of like. These are two tone because people could say uh, yes to all potential responses, and then there's some people who only responded, you know, to one thing, and so that gives uh, gives me an occasion of We asked specifically about cleaning. Again, uh, folks were strongly supportive around picking up hypodermic needles and, and waste cleanup, uh, regular litter cleanup, graffiti removal, cleaning up large trash piles, and uh, anti and helping to help businesses apply anti graffiti coating that can go over painted walls. And so if somebody tags it, it's really easy to wipe it off or spray it off. Um, so, based off of that information, we proposed um, two core components to the safety program. First, uh, unlike last time, this time we proposed doing nighttime security patrols, so contracting out the service to be able to do a patrol during the night. We heard from several property owners that that was a main concern. Um, we didn't feel like we wanted to contract, have our own staff out on the street uh, doing that work during the night. Uh, and that would be better to, to hire somebody to, to do it. Um, the other component was having daytime, during the daytime, having labor and safety ambassadors. And so they would be uh, in the, the first uh, year or two, the idea is that they would be contracted for easier implementation, but over time, we want to shift them into the full staff position for the organization. Um, they would provide that monitoring, patrolling, uh, looking for safety concerns, uh, and also being able to connect people and youth with social services. Uh, as they're doing that work, they can easily be doing the cleaning up litter and graffiti as they go on the street, uh, and then monitoring for some parking violations, which has been a concern in the past. Uh, we, through our Convergence Collaborative and our nonprofit social service work group that is part of that work, uh, those nine nonprofits have set a priority for creating a uh, health and safety initiative that would be a collaboration between this BIA effort, Texas Health and Health uh, Community Outreach Team, and the city's uh, COVID. And so we're hoping for a strong partnership between those three uh, institutions moving forward. Um, we could also help with major spot cleanup efforts. There's a small amount of uh, budget for that, uh, as well as for potentially for lighting, cameras, and public trash tape. Next, um, we have identified some budget for parking. Uh, in large degree, the ambassadors, daytime ambassadors, can help identify parking issues as we are not on the street. But in addition, there will be some funding. Uh, for an idea we've had since 2019 of uh, standardizing uh, what is public right of way, but, public, but uh, private parking within public right of way uh, in the neighborhood. So wherever there's an unimproved right of way next to a building or for parking for that business, that's actually managed by the business itself, not by in terms of signage. So to improve um, our parking issues, we can standardize that and signage throughout the neighborhood. So there's some funding to help do that. Um, the enhancement program uh, survey that showed really strong support for bringing back the farmers market, potentially having events, music festivals, and there was a public art, street poles, 
uh, banner the sign saying it's the, the farmers market for building up the supportive bill. It's a little unclear what our role would be, particularly to make sure that it comes back. Um, I, we do know that there's some financial burden to being here on Wednesday nights um, in the neighborhood. So it used to be every Wednesday night there'd be a farmers market on uh, 32nd Street. And you know, they, there's not a lot of turnover or a lot of visitors coming through. And so there may be a role to make sure that that's an economically viable uh, activity to help activate. Um, so that's one leading thing for helping to do it. And our survey showed that that was the strongest thing that folks wanted to identify. So in summary, our proposed budget for this work was 215,000 for the safety cleaning program, of which uh, almost the entirety of that is for the nighttime security and daytime safety ambassadors. Um, 15,000 for parking, which is a lot of the signage and some staff time to help do that signage work. Um, the enhancement program, uh, which included events like making sure that the farmers market comes back um, and potentially even physical improvements to the neighborhood. Uh, like we're doing the mural project this year, so we could have some assistance to make sure that this project comes forward. Um, we generally need organizational website and general materials for and uh, basic systems for communicating with property owners. So most of our communication budget is going to be some organizational needs. And then finally, uh, the uh, overseeing and accounting of, of so that 290,000, we are the global piece pit in here. Every BIA budget has to account for potentially not collecting all of the revenues from all of our property owners. Um, we have to project that that might be, in this case it's 10,000, it might be more, it might be less, uh, but we had to uh, account for it through the budget. So total is 300,000 accounting for that missing piece. Um, there's also potential, you know, um, yeah, so So again, um, you know, what we heard is we provide the services to who wants it the most. Now, the BIA, we have to draw boundaries to some extent. Uh, not everybody is going to be supportive or sign their petitions and support, but we want to draw the boundaries as best we can to have the areas that are as strong as support as possible. Um, the other note is if we draw the boundaries so narrowly compared to last time and there are people outside those boundaries who like to join again, um, they, we can do that possibly through when it goes before city council and city council could redraw the boundaries at that point to be to include them. Or we could do it on contract with property owners uh, to receive those services. So that if you're outside those boundaries, um, we're happy to continue to engage in a conversation about how to include you. So these were the boundaries that we identified as having the strongest support based off of our 2019-2020 outreach. Uh, there's four discrete areas. Uh, each could be their own BIA. They wouldn't be very big BIAs if they would, uh, but they could be. Um, so we have the Northwest sector, Northeast, where we are today, uh, at the hotel. Uh, Southwest, which is the south end of McDougal. And then Southeast, which is uh, crossing the BNS on the tracks, where there's been a lot of issues for safety concerns over the years, um, but also <coughs> the South and the Smith, where there's been safety concerns. So those are the four areas that we identified as having the strongest support to move forward with. Uh, in total, that's about 140 parcels and 65 property owners. In setting the rate, we went to the survey and we tried to get as much information like how do we, what's the right rate structure. Um, we had some input from the survey that suggested we should just adopt the Downtown Everett Association's BIA rates. We, and that was probably the overwhelmingly supported structure. When we applied that to our neighborhood though, we are vastly different land uses and it impacted property owners uh, in pretty severe ways. Uh, and so we fell back onto the same, into a similar methodology as last time, 
which is trying to balance out the revenue coming from the land value of a parcel versus of the entire neighborhood, we should say, home value uh, versus the land size. So we're roughly trying to get budget equally from uh, each side. Um, that meant because land values have increased since 2019 that we reduced the rate on land value from 67 cents per thousand dollars of value to 50 cents per thousand dollars. Uh, and then the land size uh, rate would stay the same at four cents. Um, in reaching out to property owners, we, we did hear that uh, hotels were unique in terms of their business model uh, and that the certainty, uh, that certainty was needed around the market value number. Um, and so uh, we heard and agreed to switch that from land value to the building itself, how many gross feet are in the building. Uh, so that is set at six cents per gross square foot, in addition to the total parcel size. Uh, this is very similar to how downtown Tacoma does it. Uh, just a few example annual assessments. Um, so we have uh, Compass Health, uh, 18,400. Uh, I'll pick up a nonprofit here. Housing Hope, 7,500. And then HFC Bird for the every downtown storage uh, facilities, there's two here at 12,000. I didn't put a small one here. Um, I think Greg Disdale is probably the smallest. No, uh, Chuck, Chuck's not the smallest. Um, it's probably the smallest here at 2,300. To give a sense, you can, if you know those properties, you can kind of compare yourselves to them. Um, C Sport has two separate, or technically three parcels, but two separate business locations. Um, so it would be basically half of that if you're thinking of one of those locations. So we have also built in accountability. Uh, of one, we're starting smaller, it's trying to right size it to our strongest supporters. It gets renewed after five years, which is on the shorter end of BIAs. Uh, we will have a ratepayer board uh, approved by the mayor and city council and with some uh, direction from property owners here who should be on that board. And just like last time, it must only be comprised of property owners or ratepayers, um, must be representative of the diversity of land uses and sizes and business types, um, and it will be quarterly at least to make sure that uh, we're keeping uh, on track with our plan. Again, our budget is small and right sized. It's approved annually by the ratepayer board and ratepayers at the annual meeting, as well as by the city. And we'll have performance targets to track our revenue. Um, just a few things that I knew. We have a lot more focus on the nighttime private patrols. That's a new thing. Um, a better model or a different model. Uh, then on the neighborhood safety ambassadors of that partnership with Compass Health and the city. Uh, the boundaries have been right size, the budget is smaller, and this is a place to, to grow from. So, what's next? Um, as of this week, last week, we are now at 63.7% support um, of the within the defined boundaries of the total assessment that we project. Um, and so that triggers us uh, providing the participants to the city and asking them to proceed forward with drafting an ordinance to help establish the right. We are going to continue to build support. We want to make sure that we have as much support as possible. We know that uh, the, the support exists there that is more. Um, so we have contacted all of last time's supporters and uh, over the next couple of days, we'll be reaching out to all property owners, making sure that they're uh, aware of the proposal and inviting them to participate in the BIA. Uh, we don't you know exactly know the timeline here because uh, the administration has to write the ordinance, has to agree to it. We have to get it before council. Um, we uh, don't therefore we don't know the exact start date of the BIA and when services could be launched. If you're very excited about the BIA, it's like when can I get my services? Uh, I can't tell you that exactly. 
Um, you know, I think our perspective is the sooner the better. Um, realistically, you know, there's probably some timing with the calendar year and other things that would logically fall into place. I think that's my last slide, so I'm happy to take questions. Uh, if folks, looks like Nick may have uh, a question online. Uh, I wanted to add a quick comment. Yeah. Just uh, this idea of right sizing and kind of having a smaller boundary and, uh, and expanding later, it really comes out of the research that the board did early on. We talked to several different business improvement areas around in the region, and we hired uh, an expert who's done this um, throughout the Pacific Northwest. And what's really clear in our conversations is that when you start a BIA, what inevitably happens is that, you know, people see that it, is benefiting their neighbors and, and a lot of times even people who are uh, adamantly opposed to it from the beginning want to join in. And so it's very much kind of uh, the tail of a lot of the starts of business improvement areas in the region. So we felt like this was really something that we could get started and, and add to in the future with a lot of confidence. Uh, we had a question from the council members from Nick Brennan of Portera. Great. Okay, so I'm going to read it off, Nick. Um, and if others online have questions, feel free to write it in the chat or uh, just indicate it by writing something in the chat. Um, so, uh, what is your read on how a renewed BIA proposal will be received at council? Is there a community support threshold you want to see? If that threshold is met, do you think the proposal would pass the vote? What can the USDA do to uh, proactively address concerns? Great, Mary, you want to go first? Great question. Well, you have both of us here, obviously, so um, that's sort of two fans likely in the room. Uh, we're not exactly allowed to do an assessment as far as uh, how people will vote or feel on things, but uh, it is a majority of different council members as before. And it sounds like you're done on everyone on board, uh, higher numbers. So I think that's great. <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to go into that. So. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with Pepper Fossey's assessment. Um, I'd add that. You know, personally, I'm really supportive of these efforts. I think that um, efforts like these that are by us for us, it's really important to ensure that priorities are in alignment with what the community needs and wants. And um, so, I don't know. Nick had like eight questions, and I pulled the yeah, <laughs> question. Um, right. Don't do anything with that. Uh, he was wondering if there might be a higher threshold. Uh, than the 60%. Sure, yeah, I think that uh, I can imagine that some of the hesitancy might be from wanting to see what the final plan looks like. And so understanding what people are getting from their money might, getting for their money might be helpful to change the percentage. I'd be curious if the 63.7% supporting means that there's 36.3 in opposition or if there's some that are on the fence or anything along those lines. But um, I think that this is definitely, you know, Super majority, which is always a, a good sign of support. Um, I should, but I should make sure it's, it's known that it's not like there's thirty six point three percent support uh, of opposition because uh, we've been reaching out to our supporters to start with. We're going to continue to reach out. To them. We have twenty three supporters right now, uh, and we probably need up the whole there's sixty five from. And uh, those seven or so, mostly it's just folks who uh, haven't had the time to do that. Uh, we have most of that, like seven group, uh, we've only shot the most. So. I saw that Craig Scott don't have a comment yes. in the chat. Um, comment and question. Uh, Craig says, I understand that the best practice in the formation of the BIA is to document existing services provided by public entities, uh, for example, security, cleanup, et cetera. 
The intent is that those services would remain at the same level and be supplemented by services provided by the government. As the ESDA is documented, the services currently provided by public agencies. Um, that's a, a good question. Um, we could detail those. I think that we get to a, maybe a deeper level, which is something that maybe the city would need to do for us, which is you know, how many uh, person hours is being dedicated by the force patrols, um, or how, how much time is being dedicated by the COET team uh, to the neighborhood. And those are numbers that are not within our purview, like these are things that we have. Um, I think certainly the intention is, as Craig says, is this is a supplemental effort, not a substitutional effort. Um, and so we would want to make work with the city to make sure that that is the case. I, I'm unaware outside of maybe the SOTO BIA of any contractual arrangement between a BIA and the city of like say we must provide so many police hours at the neighborhood uh, and, and we'll provide X number of additional security patrols. Uh, I'm only guessing that the SOTO BIA may have something like that because they're adding a to their police department. Uh, so that would be interesting. They're, they're the only BIA that I know that actually is filing the hours of the federal city police department. Yours is an off duty officer and taken security. That's correct. Yeah. I mean, it could be an off duty officer that would be contracted by the security firm for the night time. Comment, question, Liz? I just wanted to add that when I was at the Alliance for Pioneer Square, there was a short time where the the BIA funded supplemental police because it was needed at the time. Yeah. Essentially, this is an investment by property owners in additional enhanced services for their neighborhood, not a replacement of existing services. Uh, provided by public jurisdictions. So it's uh, really subject to a commitment from the public jurisdiction that they will sustain their effort uh, of supporting the uh, well being of the neighborhood. Are there other questions? Craig had a follow up for Liz and I, which was uh, whether we had considered partnering with ESDA, considered partnering with DEA, and provided some of the service. And, uh, because VA does have a BIA downtown um, and has a BIA program manager. So whether like the clean safe program could be overseen by the downtown organization um, And I, we have talked about it, but we have made zero commitments one way or the other. Um, I think a big part of our work has been um, getting the estimates for how much it costs to, for the contracted service. And then we obviously are not going to contract with somebody before we uh, have the BIA established. And so just in order of, of the order of operation is first to have the BIA and then to have an RFP process of some sort, uh, of which certainly we would invite and maybe have additional conversations with the BIA about how that would look if they we're interested. Philosophically, we're very committed to collaboration anytime that uh, it's feasible and um, with the belief that collective action is stronger than individual action. So those kind of uh, leveraging opportunities will be at the heart of the discussion as we talk about how to implement this program. Uh, once it is approved, so we're focused on that getting it approved process at the moment. Other questions? All right, we do have a, additional items on our agenda yes, today. And we need to move ahead to be able to accomplish this within the time frame yeah. that we have. So just one last thing on BIA. I hope you're excited about it. You're looking forward to it and that, uh, you know, you talk to your fellow property owners, uh, if you have signed on, uh, signing that 
contacting me or I will be contacting you and signing your petitions in support. Um, and then uh, if your neighbors talk to you about it, and talk to you about the PI. So thank you so much for that. Well, uh, just one additional comment, and that is that there are some property owners that are not supportive. Uh, there appear to be pretty small numbers, uh, but fundamentally their point of view is that this was always, always been an industrial neighborhood and that it uh, should stay as such and that resident in industry and residential and transportation center uh, don't belong together and that they'll say that to you very clearly if, uh, if they get in a conversation with uh, anybody about this proposal. Um, it's been hard because they don't participate in the conversations and they don't look at the case examples from around the nation that we pointed to as good examples of how this does in fact work in many other places. Uh, but you know, heads up, this is uh, going along smoothly with yeses from everybody we've talked to so far, uh, but uh, there may well be uh, deeper and more volatile conversations as we go forward. Eventually, it's going to get to the city administration, or they have it now in their hands, and it'll get to the council. Hopefully, uh, in the near future, um, we're going to need active and vocal support from all those who believe this is the best uh, uh, way to build a healthy, strong, vibrant uh, neighborhood. So. Uh, it sounds so good when you present all of the elements of it, but uh, we got a ways to go in order to get this enacted. Let's move, let's move ahead to the uh, uh, presentation starting uh, on Fancy at Everlink extension. All right. Um, Eric, um, you should be able to share. Okay, I'll, I'll share my screen. Can you hear me okay? So we've got uh, uh, 37 minutes remaining and we need to move to three topics. So, um, Eric, if you could uh, organize your presentation in about 10 minute uh, framework. Sure, I'll do that. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eric Williams Trent with Sound Transit. I'm the North Quarter Development Director for the Everett Link Extension and the OMF North. And with me is Lauren Douglas, the, the Deputy Project Director. Uh, happy to be here today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, ongoing things with Sound Transit, kind of start general and then get down to specifics with the Everett Link extension. So just the overview, current construction activity and then Everett Link, uh, starting big picture, you know, the Sound Transit district serves, you know, three counties, 40% of the state's population, region of over 3 million people, 52 cities and uh, almost 1100 square miles. The region is supposed to grow by 800,000 people by 2040. So there's definitely a, a need for additional mobility options for, for the residents of the three counties. And uh, Sound Transit is governed by 18 uh, local elected members, local elected officials, and the uh, Washington State Transportation Secretary. So just a quick look. You know, we've got, you know, ST3 was passed by the voters in uh, 2016. That will consist of uh, 116 miles of light rail, 91 miles of sounder, 45 miles of stride uh, bus rapid transits. Uh, we're gonna be opening stations every few years now on many of these lines. And along with these stations, you'll see parking facilities, bike and pedestrian uh, paths. And these facilities are gonna end up saving about 792,000 tons a year of greenhouse gases. So that's a pretty good, good savings. Current construction activity, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, construction going on around the region. You know, the Northgate extension, three stations opened last fall, Northgate, Roosevelt, U District. We got stations in Tacoma, East Link, Linwood, 
when we're looking going up north, Federal Way in Redmond coming up in the next few years. So total of 25 stations. You know, we had, uh, we had a uh, slight delay with construction because of the concrete strike. So that's gonna probably delay some things, but we're, we're back in business and moving forward with all these projects. So a highlight on uh, Linwood Link. I think you can see the, uh, you know, the, the facts here, the details on it should be opening 2024. Uh, I'll go over construction segments of Linwood. So we, first we've got the, the L200, and this is the southern segment of the Linwood light rail extension, Northgate to 200th Street, 65% uh, complete right now. And here's some photos of the line under construction, 148th Street garage and station, 185th Street station photos. The next segment is L300, and this is from 200th up to the Linwood Transit Center, and that's 63% complete. I've uh, got some photos here, just construction work, Montlake Terrace, I-5 crossing and the Linwood Garage. Now I'll get down to uh, what may be of more interest to you, a little uh, more topical to your, your area, uh, the Everett Link Extension. So this project is 16 miles in length, it consists of six funded stations and one provisional unfunded station. The goal is to open, uh, opening schedule is the target schedule is 2037, and then the affordable schedule of getting to Everett Station in 2041. We'd also have an operation and maintenance facility that will be opening in 2034, and there would be additional parking at, uh, you know, at the Everett Station and uh, Mariner Station, which will be opening in 2046. Tell you a little about the overall project schedule, where we're at right now. So right now we're in the planning phase doing alternatives development. We've just completed a level one alternatives evaluation. And on the next slide, I'll kind of get into more details about that. The plan is to get into, to have a recommendation uh, from the community advisory group, the elected leadership group early next year. And that recommendation would then be forwarded to the Sound Transit Board for recommendation. And that recommendation would be for a set of alternatives, a, a preferred alignment and station areas and other uh, alternatives to study in the environmental phase, which would start next year. The schedule shows we start in design in 2026 and then going into construction uh, in 2030. So a little bit more about that uh, screening process that we're in now, the alternatives development. We started with an initial range of screening. We had, and I will point out that the, the, the right side of this funnel is showing where there were opportunities for public feedback during this alternatives development phase. You know, we had public feedback during the early scoping phase so the uh, public was able to comment on uh, a broad range of alternatives. We then screened that initial set of alternatives through some uh, evaluation criteria, refined that and came up with our level one alternatives. And most recently, we were able to screen down from level one alternatives using public feedback and the community advisory group and then went to the elected leadership group in April to make a recommendation for what we're gonna be studying in level two, which we're in the process of starting now. As I mentioned earlier, later this year, we'll go into project scoping, which takes place prior to the environmental review. Again, allowing the public another chance to comment on the alternatives being evaluated in, in level two and to make any other suggestions on things that they'd like to see studied. This is a highlight showing what the, this is the, the Everett Station area, and I wanted to show you what the community advisory group and the elected leadership group, what things, uh, alignments they wanted to see moving forward for further study in uh, level two. So in level one, we evaluated four station areas. Uh, Everett Station A was the representative alignment from Sound Transit 3. Then we had Everett B and C, and those were located between the blocks of uh, McDougal and Broadway. And then Everett D uh, would travel along Broadway. Everett A would actually uh, sort of uh, be closest to the uh, Everett train station. 
So as you can see, there was a little bit of a split decision between the community advisory group and the elected leadership group. The CAG wanted to see alignments, station areas A, B, C move forward, and the elected leadership group wanted to see station alignments A, C, and D move forward. The reason the elected leadership group gave for this difference was that they wanted to still see evaluation of a station area closer to downtown Everett, and that was what station area D um, would serve they get to get closest to downtown Everett. They also felt that station, by moving forward with station area C, uh, you could still consider uh, station area B as a, almost a subset. So looking at those two together. Uh, onto the OMF North sites. So we originally had eight sites that we were evaluating. And during this most recent screening process, we screened down to four recommended sites to evaluate further. These are located on the map. You can see the B sites are located just east of the Boeing facilities. Uh, site E, and I should say the sites we're moving forward with uh, based on the recommendation are in purple. Site E is located at Airport and 100th Street, just east of south of Payne Field. And then another site at SR99 in Gibson, uh, very close to the SR99 Airport Road intersection. I do want to point out that there's a couple of other stations that as we look at other alignments along the corridor or along for the project, we'll be looking at other uh, potential um, OMF sites that did get screened out. More about that now. So what we've been doing is we have the alternatives that went from level one to level two for screening. We've also been looking at the early scoping comments made by the public and seeing if there are other alignments or considerations that we should be studying. Based on that, there are a couple alignments that we received from the early scoping that we are going to be studying in level two. And I'm showing you those on the map here. So the two alignments that really came out of the early scoping that we hadn't previously studied were an I-5 alignment shown here in teal and an alignment going up SR99 Evergreen Way shown in brown. These two alignments uh, would, would uh, and I think the goal for the consideration of these alignments based on what we heard from the public is you know, the question was asked, well, can you get to Everett sooner or cheaper by not doing the westward swing over to Southwest Everett Industrial Center and Payne Field? And so we're, we are taking a look at these alignments in level two. The, the teal station on, on I-5 would swing along the, the west side of Everett Mall and would have a new station at Everett Mall and then rejoin the alignment uh, north of the 526 I-5 interchange uh, with a relocated station in Mariner at the south end. The SR-99 airport, or not SR-99 evergreen alignment would swing off of the representative alignment in pink uh, at SR-99 with the new 99 airport road station, continue northeast along Evergreen Way up to uh, the stations we're studying at 526 Evergreen, it would then uh, rejoin the representative alignment and continue north. Um, so I guess with the with the I five alignment, we would only have five stations under consideration, and with the ninety nine Evergreen alignment, we have six stations and no provisional station would would, would be uh, so we, the ninety nine Airport Road station would probably be fully funded with that alignment with no station at Southwest Ever Industrial. So the purpose of the level two evaluation is to look at these, uh, do a de more detailed analysis on the alternatives. And I should say that for level two, we're gonna be looking at station area differences up and down in each of the station areas along the corridor. We'll be looking at segment differences. And then also, you know, like we're showing on I-5, SR99 and the representative alignment. And then also looking at end-to-end -end alignments. Things we'll be finding and evaluating ridership, cost, uh, environmental impacts, walkability, uh, uh, impact on uh, communities of concern. And then uh, we'll also be doing outreach as part of this and another, uh, another round of uh, screening to get to our recommendations at the end of level tool two. We'll have uh, online presence later this year. 
and that will help inform our community advisory group and our elected leadership group going forward. So here's a, a quick link for the project websites. And you know, this will have updates, project documents, initial analysis, feedback, and then meeting summaries. Like went through that one pretty quick, but I did want to save time for questions. And uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions and uh, go over anything you'd like to discuss further. All right, we're open for questions. Anybody in the room, starting there, and then we'll go to the Zoom side. Anybody have any uh, questions? No question, but I'm very excited to see that the I-5 alignment is being considered. And yes, that's what we heard a lot of, got a lot of feedback from in early scoping. So we wanted to make sure we did give that one uh, due consideration as we look to evaluate a reasonable range of alternatives. Uh, going into the environmental process. Any comments uh, from those online? Brock, do you see anything in the chat? <laughs> I'm bumping everything around on my screen since we switched presentations, so uh, just like it. I don't see any um, questions. Is it just to be completely ignorant? Is it so if they went with the I-5 alignment and then later on the other ones are going out towards Boeing coming back in, like, is that a post, you know, get one, one step done and then revisit it? And so as it's developed down south, et cetera, how are the other auxiliary arms or added like, oh, it'd be great if we, we need more ridership over here or, did you get that question, Eric? Yeah, so it sounds like if, you know, if we, like, if we just read the question, that sounds like if, if the preferred alignment is going up straight up I-5, how would service to uh, Southwest Ever Industrial and uh, Boeing or the, the Evergreen neighborhoods, how would those areas be served? Uh, could that be, and, and I guess as part of ST3, it would just be, there's, there's no uh, allowance for a spur like that. That's not to say it couldn't happen at some future date down the line. But the other option is to look at how that could be served, coordinating with um, Community Transit and Ever Transit and their, uh, their SWIFT lines, how that would, and you know, we are coordinating with, with both transit agencies uh, throughout the project as we look at the preferred alignment and how their service can better connect with our stations. So that, that, that is an opportunity to look at uh, using community transit to provide access from sound transit stations to those other destinations via uh, bus rapid transit. But I might just add for those who are, uh, don't interface with community transit, bus rapid transit system as much, uh, the existing green line, which is the bus rapid transit, some of the fewer stops, very nice off of uh, That currently goes up Airport Road uh, and then uh, that is at Seaway Transit Center, which is across the street basically from Boeing's headquarters and has a stop that as close as you can get essentially to paint fuel uh, while staying on Airport Road. And then long term, they have a plan for Silver Line, uh, which the route is not exactly figured out, but basically goes from Seaway Transit Center to Oak Creek, and so there's a potential upgrade to Creek that would be similar to what uh, would be served by this type of So, thank you, Eric, very much for your presentation, and uh, Lauren for joining us. Uh, and we appreciate uh, the ongoing communication that Sound Transit is providing to us, and look forward to. Uh, opportunities as we move forward to stay abreast of your decision making and, and the planning process. Thanks for being here today. Well, and Eric and Lauren, we encourage you to stick on for the next presentation uh, <laughs> because we want to update folks on a proposal that ESDA has had for our station area. So, right, yeah, definitely want to stay on for that. But appreciate the opportunity to be here and encourage everyone to. You know, comment uh, at our next public comment period and uh, look forward to getting your input. Thank you. The X option. All right. So, 
ESDA has provided two comment letters, both during early scoping and then level one analysis, which they uh, talk about uh, in terms of the Everglades extension. Can you make the window a little bit bigger if you care? Oh, yeah. So, um, one of our proposals has been what we termed option X. And so, I'm going to highlight that and kind of give a status update as to where we're at in terms of that work. Getting So this is the neighborhood looking from the southwest towards the northeast. So this is uh, option B. Uh, option C. Option A. So those are the ones that are still on the table. And option X that we're proposing. Yeah, that's where we're focusing. There's a gray line there. Trust me. Uh, this <laughs> comes back later. See, see, see. Um, during our comment letters, you know, what we asked for was additional analysis as the project moves forward on how the alignments could impact vehicular traffic uh, and lane capacity reduction, especially in Broadway, freight and delivery truck operations, especially on Google, potential impact of noise shadows views uh, on adjacent development or future development. Whether power, line, power lines would have to be relocated, which is an issue both on Broadway and Google. Uh, then also the opportunities to catalyze development, increase pedestrian volumes based on location, and group transit, depending on how the station is designed. So those were the things that kind of were consistent in our comment letters. Just to orient us, you know, what does an elevated structure look like? Uh, so this is light rail that's elevated down by Angle Lake. And so as it's, as the alignment comes uh, under the two proposals, either on Broadway or McDougal, we would expect that it would likely be an elevated structure along those two routes. And so we would see something like this. If it needed for some reason on those two routes, which I don't think it will, but, it, but possibly on the route that goes along Smith Avenue, uh, you might have a structure that helps move the, the alignment across it. So you have this very large structure that goes over the road. So the guideway get over the road. So this is in Northgate. Uh, and then the station itself might look something like this. Could look a lot of different ways, but this is the Northgate station. Just so you have it, uh, you haven't seen the Northgate station. <coughs> this is elevated. Uh, around the base of it is the bus operations. So one of our concerns was traffic to Broadway for the alignment of uh, option B. And so here's, you know, think of the elevated structure either in the middle, on the east or west side of the street, you know, what, how big that would be, potential impact to traffic, potential impact to views. Uh, uh, potential noise implications for the recent development. Um, on McDougal, um, there's a lot of light industrial uh, businesses. ESCA is strongly supportive of our light industrial uses and have expressed that we believe the transit development makes sense north of 33rd Street and the south of 33rd Street that uh, for the foreseeable future we view that as being mostly light industrial. And we have a lot of light industrial uh, users down there that we would like to continue. So this view is actually north of this is a uh, Pacific and a Google. Um, but you can get the sense the state uh, option C, the station would be on the looks the right side of the street, the west side of the street. So here's one of our uh, distribution businesses farther down with Google. With a lot of bays that kind of look at that face right off the table. So the pillars of the structure could have a substantial impact. In addition, the construction of the structure could also have a pretty big impact over the two years during the construction period. Um, so we're raising these concerns. We want them to be analyzed. Um, but is there an option out there that might be a, an option that doesn't have those challenges? And so 
both of our 2019 planning work, which is this document, and our 2020-2021 planning work, look at having potentially a station uh, on the east side of the BNSF tracks near the Pacific. And this particular option shows it going on both sides of the Pacific coming into Death Ridge. We also did some renderings of what that might look like, 3D renderings. So this is a rendering of uh, the light rail going up and over the BNSF tracks onto the east side and having a station location where the sound transfer flight you want is coming. Um, here's just one more rendering of looking at it through these principles. So we think. You know, we don't know exactly if this option was to be put on the table, what it could like, what exactly the design of it could be, but we try to think through well, how could we make this as best as possible for integrating it into the neighbor fabric of the neighborhood and optimizing transit intentions. So, this was one idea to have the station basically go underneath the bridge structure on either side of Pacific Avenue. And then uh, our consultant. Um, in 2024, a convergence study looked at putting uh, a parking garage um, on the Smith Avenue ramp that goes up the Pacific, like between that and the, and the tracks. And their thought with that was the idea of being able to uh, integrate um, the two sides of the tracks with a land bridge um, where people could walk across the bridge. And at the same level of the Pacific Avenue. So it would just be basically an extension of the Pacific Avenue bridge, um, but would ramp up uh, with the existing bridge structure. The benefit is that it could also integrate directly with Pacific Avenue into uh, these red lines show bus only lanes. And the city's preferred location of option C. Um, that has been designated through the its city comprehensive plan, metro plan, as a similar integration of having major bus routes on Pacific with bus only lanes. So we can duplicate that same style of transfer uh, with this location as well. Uh, and so you see these bus lanes, we can drive in, or the bus drivers can be able to pull up at these bus stops, transfers can happen very seamlessly. In addition, by having the um, the station on either side of Pacific allows you know connections on both sides for buses as well as a shorter walking distance from the north side of the of the roadway towards downtown. So that's one idea. Um, in addition to the concerns that we had, you know, a major impact, major thing to consider is uh, the ability for the station location to catalyze development in the right places and. Uh, in our 2021 study, the consultant looked at the development of capacity across the neighborhood. And what you're seeing here, this is a map of the neighborhood. And it's kind of uh, finished might be hard to see, at least in person. Um, the two sites with the largest development capacity is the Lowe's development site, uh, sorry, the Lowe's property. Uh, and the property owner there would like to develop at some point. And the city's um, uh, public work site. And so the, the public work site, which is here, um, they need to move out because of seismic issues with the building and they need to move to Epic and Everett Point, Point Industrial Center. Um, and so there's going to be this piece of property that they're looking to redevelop. Those two sites are fine for six million gross square feet. It's a huge development capacity. So comparing option C to option X in terms of development capacity, you know, first, um, because of the alignment of option C, it goes through blocks, meaning that development is not possible on those blocks. There's about five blocks become undeveloped uh, just because of the alignment itself. Um, next, there's a very large number of properties that are not going to be redeveloped because they're within the county or they're in the arena or PV. Um, this is Town Transit's property. No, this is a, an industrial area. Um, and then there's some recently developed properties that aren't going to get catalyzed for development because they're happening. So that's Compass Health uh, Block, 
as well as the reconnect departments. Okay. So this is what remains for development capacity. The darker green means you can go up to 25 floors for development. Uh, and then the mid green is about seven floors, seven to 11 floors of development. But there's also the height of the building. There's also the hillside, which impacts the walking distance to it. Um, and most of the low site is outside of the four mile walking distance. So it's really not that developable as a result of the station location. So if we look at the option X location, both the low site, I'm just going to flip to it, both the low site and the ever public work site are almost directly adjacent, which makes those two sites developable in, uh, as terms of catalyzing the numbers. So if we compare the two sites, you can see there's a lot more potential with an option X option and an option C option. On the right there is a development from the screen that's sort of above you of the future library station, which shows that most of the development that they've had in there is within a quarter mile. So. so we have been trying to ask the agency to look at this proposal as an additional station location. Um, not saying that they have to do it or that we're in favor of it, but we just want to analyze that way the things that we've looked at can be looked at officially by the agency itself and be on the table for discussion. Um, just a quick summary. So I think you know our next steps is I think we're going to hear a lot more from the businesses along with Google about their concerns. Well we're also going to highlight the potential benefits of the option X location uh, as an organization. Uh, and obviously we've gone into level two analysis by the agency. Uh, we're not expecting this to get right into level two analysis right away, but we're hoping that we can have this as part of the conversation uh, by the end of the year. So on the basis of this analysis and the pros and cons uh, with the various sites, the Everest Station District Alliance Board of Directors has urged Sound Transit to consider option X in their analysis. That's kind of the bottom line here. Uh, and we wanted everybody to uh, understand uh, what option X is as we uh, discuss this going forward and that there is an official request to add this as a study area for sound transit as it moves forward. Yeah. Any we questions? Don't, we don't really have time, don't really have time for, for questions. questions. Yeah. Uh, if you have questions, you can connect with Brock anytime. Yep. Uh, and uh, we have one final item on the agenda. There are five development projects uh, in the neighborhood happening likely this year. Uh, and uh, one of them is the doubling of the size of the Kaiser Permanente footprint and space. Uh, in our neighborhood, and it's under construction already. And we have with us Nicole Pettigrew, who is going to give us an update. And I'm hoping to see uh, some renderings. I don't know if we'll see that today or not, but we've been waiting to see uh, what it might look like when it's done. Uh, so, Nicole, the floor is yours. And we've got until two o'clock, which is six minutes. I will speed through. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. All right, awesome. So I will hurry up. I am available by email for questions as well. Both Brock and Ed know how to get a hold of me. But as you know, we have been working. I had the opportunity to speak to you all in December at the last board meeting. And we are continuing to plan for expansion, not only in Everett, but in many of our facilities across the Puget Sound area. We actually um, purchased the old Keymart in Kent. We have demolished it and we will build, be building a new facility in Kent as well. So that's underway along with our Everett um, expansion. Everett's a little bit different because this will be a specialty center and our specialty centers really highlight our integrated health care by offering primary care and specialty care all in one convenient location. So that is what's coming to Everett. And Ed, I do have some wonderful pictures. So we have an amazing project manager, his name's Tyler Clark. I was hoping I could snag him for this meeting, but he's super busy. 
um, who is working on this project and he was able to provide me the following renderings. But we will have this specialty care center that will have radiology, lab, pharmacy, observation units, and surgical suites within this footprint. Um, we have begun construction and we have a goal of finishing construction in the fall of 2024 and open for patient care late 2024. So our current Everett um, Medical Center will stay operational throughout construction. And here we go. So this is the uh, rendering of the exterior. This will be two buildings that will we're not demolishing our old building, so we're adding to our existing. There will be two buildings that will have a central check-in that will be accessed off of Pine Street. And so you see that here. And just another angle. This is this beautiful welcoming um, new entrance that will be built. Our interior concepts, you know, they really, um, design the buildings for the environment. And of course, Washington is just beautiful and green and nature. And so we will be bringing these concepts into the interior of our facilities. And this is some of our concept artwork. Now, one really cool thing is that we intend to engage local artists for hung and sculpture art pieces throughout our new medical center. Um, I, Ed or Brock um, introduced me to a local artist already who we've put in contact um, with our design team. So please keep those coming. We would love to engage local artists from Snohomish County on this project. So this is just some conceptual artwork, but we are really hoping to um, engage local artists um, to join this effort. Here's some interior renderings. This is the reception desk. Um, Kaiser Permanente is all about thriving, thriving in our communities, thriving in our families. So we call it our Thrive Bar, which will be on the, the ground level. Um, we have a cafe. Uh, this, our clinical space will be um, connected through the existing structure to make it seem feel and seem seamless, that the two buildings don't feel like two whole different buildings. And our existing building will go through a whole brand continuity to really get it up to um, Kaiser Permanente standards. So that will go hand in hand with the construction of our new facility. Um, this is some more interior. This is our interior medical station infusion clinic, which will be there. Um, some of our staff areas. This is really cool. This is our exterior. So we really are going to make a beautiful landscaping design. Um, you'll see, this is all from the Pine Street view and you'll see the overall plan here of where this is. There'll be a roundabout built through here. Um, it's just a really incredibly beautiful, well thought out design. Um, it's taken us a little while to get up and running, but we are hitting the ground running and they're working very quick and super excited to bring this all to our. I think that is my last picture. There will also be a new parking structure in addition to the office um, space. And I think that's about it as far as pictures and renderings and updates to, are there any questions? Charles has a question. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, uh, my question, I don't know if it, you're the right person to ask this question about, but on the property that um, that development is happening, there used to be a homeless youth shelter uh, that I lived at. And I was just wondering if there was gonna be any kind of commemoration for uh, for that shelter uh, in in this development, even if it's just like a plaque. Well, I I'm not the person to ask, but I will definitely um, get an answer. I'm writing it down. It's true. A lot of youth were served at the Cocoon House facility over the years. What was the name of it, Ed? Cocoon House. They moved out of the neighborhood just a year or two ago, um, but they were here in this neighborhood for a long time serving almost youth. Awesome. 
And they still have the uh, central, um, they still have one of their locations uh, just a few blocks away. Wonderful. I will definitely bring it to our project manager's attention if it hasn't already been. Kaiser is committed to the community, obviously. It's why my boss, Gretchen Benson, is on the board of um, the ESDA and our commitment to uh, this community is large and obviously the grant um, from Kaiser Permanente, we're all in here. So I appreciate your time. Well, we're going to need to wrap up here. Uh, today, we've done a lot of presentations, and uh, the point of that is to get as many people in the neighborhood or our stakeholders informed and, and uh, involved in the development work that we are doing. Um, Brock is available uh, to uh, communicate on any ideas, questions, thoughts that have emerged out of this presentation uh, today. Uh, we uh, are really upbeat about the future of this neighborhood uh, with five uh, development projects happening just this uh, year, with the BIA being proposed, with the uh, urban art enhancements in the neighborhood, with the safety program that's being contemplated, with uh, a lot of energy and, and activity that uh, is going on. Uh, so we uh, Aspire to have as many property owners and stakeholders engaged and involved as possible. And uh, I want to just thank everybody that attended today for being part of that community uh, development activity and in collaboration with these ideas. Uh, again, uh, uh, we have a good website with a lot of the information available on the website, and then Brock is available to. Uh, answer questions and, and engage in dialogue. So, uh, done. with that, we are going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you for being here. Thank you for a good five years and 20 years of our station. Yeah.